Welcome to the Parish Art Museum. Uh, my name is Corinne Ernie. I'm the chief curator here at the museum. Thank you so much for coming on this wonderful hot summer night, but I think we have a nice breeze on the terrace. And you're in for a real treat tonight with Abram Burton and Eric McPherson Quartet. And that wonderful music is brought to us by Hamptons Jazz Fest, who has been our partner for several years now for summer concerts. And I want to thank in particular Klaus Brondahl, who will tell you more about the music tonight. And I also want to thank our Friday night sponsors, the, Com the Corcoran Group. Thank you so much. I have to lower this one a little bit. <laughs> Welcome to Hamptons Jazz Fest. Welcome to the Paris Art Museum. It's such a great venue. I'm amazed you guys are here because I saw the weather forecast. It was going to be 88 degrees and humid, and there's no way you would be here, but you're here. Yeah. I'm so happy to see you all, and I mean that from the bottom of my heart. Thank you, thank you, thank you for being here. Most of you know that I, most of you know what I believe in, and that is music, community, and good food, right? And good wine, too. We have great wine down the corner, in case you haven't noticed. So thank you for being here. This is what we believe in. Uh, Hampton Jazz Fest is a nonprofit organization. What we believe in is keeping our community and music alive. And we do that by producing as many live concerts as possible year-round, but especially our, our anger our sort of our title festival at the Hamptons Jazz Fest is something we take great pride in. This is our third year, and we have about 35 events from July, August, and half of September, which is a lot of music, and we do that on the shoestring budget. If you guys feel like you want to be part of a cool organization who promotes multiculturalism, great music, diversity, community, and togetherness, COVID taught us that without togetherness, we're really not humans anymore. So if you want to donate, if you want to be part of an organization, come and see me or any of my partners who are walking around with these t-shirts. They are, hard, they are difficult to avoid because they're going to be mingling and talking to you. But because you are here, we're able to do this. And that's really what it is. Live music deserves a great live audience, and you guys are very much alive. It is so greatly appreciated that you're here. I can't say that enough. And tonight is extraordinarily special. We have a wonderful collaboration with the Smalls Live Foundation, and the head of that foundation is Spike Wilner. You guys may be aware and, and be very familiar with the legendary Smalls nightclub in, uh, in the village. Yes, right. <laughs> Who has just been promoting and pushing great jazz for a very, very long time. No matter what, even during COVID, whatever it takes, they produced live music. Um, and you, as you can see here, this series here at the Paris Art Museum is co-produced by the Smallest Liar Foundation. The piano is the Rolls Royce of piano. Are you in for a real treat? It's a Steinway Model D. It's as big as an old Cadillac. It's a very great piano. And that was kindly lent to us by the Clavier House of Manhattan for your enjoyment. So all these efforts is just to create a wonderful venue, a nice event, and for, to create great music for you guys to enjoy. It's that simple. So without much further ado, please put your hands together and give them a lot of love. Give it up for Abraham Burden, Eric McPherson Quartet. Thank you.
How's everybody doing? Oh, that, that doesn't even sound right. I'm going to try that one more time. I said, how's everybody doing out here? You know what I mean? <laughs> right where you That's right. That's right. Oh, man, it's so nice to be out here. Oh, my goodness. Well, y'all, how many people live out here? Yeah. Oh, y'all are living, living the life, man. This is... This is nice. This is what I'm talking about. You know, I grew up in New York. I know, I know Eric grew up in New York, too. And uh, I love New York, but boy, this, this gives you, you know, just a little bit of breathing room, you know? Just catch a breath of fresh air, a little cool breeze, lots of sun. I'm Caribbean through and through, so sun, sun to me, that's everything, you know? I love, I love the nature, you know? Beautiful. You are listening to the great Mr. S Mr. Davis Whitfield on the piano, Davis Whitfield. And on the bass, the wonderful Mr. John Abier. And as far as I'm concerned, there is no other like the fabulous Mr. Eric McPherson on the drums. And my name, for those of you that don't know, my name is Abraham Burton, and I thank you so much for coming out and joining Eric and myself and John and, and Davis. Sivia, is that you looking so beautiful as always out there? Is that you, Sivia? Is that Sivia? Stop. Looking beautiful as always. That's my dear friend, Sivia. You guys know Sivia? You should. She's right there, standing up. <laughs> it's good to see some folks here, some folks that I know, lots of, lots of faces. I know, of course, uh, of course my, my, one of my uh, college professors, Mr. O'Connell. You live out this way, Mr. 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 O'Connell? You live out here? Yeah? Beautiful, man. I understand why you left. I understand. I understand. I would, I would have too, <laughs> my man. And of course, you know, we have the fantastic, very important, uh, boy, what can I say? He's just an a, 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 uh, advocate, I would say, for the music, for the music, and has been for so many years. You know, the great Mr. Joel Chris. Thank you, brother, for always putting together so many so many things, not, not only here, but all over the world. And you know, he's a very important part of the puzzle, you know, in the music, for the music industry. And speaking of, of which, also, uh, gentlemen, I don't believe he's here. Is Spike here? Spike is no, not here? Next week. Oh, okay, he's here next week. Spike Wilner, man, he's very, very important uh, part of this music and has been for many years. Not only is he a fantastic pianist, but he, he has, uh, He's had the, the club, a very important club, in my opinion, one of the great, greatest clubs ever, um, Smalls Jazz Club in Manhattan. I, I don't know how many people have been out there. Yeah, I hear you back there. Very important, because he, he keeps the music going, and he went throughout the pandemic, as a lot of people tried to do, but you know, Spike went hard, and, and uh, we really appreciate all that he's done uh, with music as a musician, and also for the music as you know, an advocate and supporter of the art form. Mm -hmm. uh, the last tune you just heard, or the first tune you heard, we were just uh, opening up, warming up a little bit with a, uh, a little interlude of one of my compositions entitled Will Never Be Forgotten. And then we uh, ended up playing, uh, going into another original of mine entitled um, uh, what was the name of that one? New Jack. <laughs> it has two titles. It, we call it, Eric and I have always called it New Jack, but I guess the, the official name was Centrifugal Force. Right, you know? Right now, and then we played, I love this tune, by uh, Mr. John Abier. What's the name of it, John? Universal Constant. Constant, written by Mr. John Abier. Yes, yes indeed. Well, my name is Abraham Burton. And uh, boy, music, it's been an amazing journey. Uh, you know, where music began for me, I think there were, it's hard to say exactly where it began, but there were key points in my life where music hit me uh, in such a way 
that I was completely just taken by it, or as they say, bitten by the bug. And uh, for me, it definitely started when I was a kid. And my dad, he, he loved playing records and, and music in the house. And uh, I can remember times where I, maybe I was, I was so young at the time, I can remember getting up from naps and, and the music is being played. And I was just so taken by the music. I would, I would, just, I would just be uh, almost in a trance, like listening to the music, like just waking up. It was almost like a dream, a state of a dream. And I remember just always falling, you know, feeling like I was in love with music by that point, at that point. But I think for me, when, when I used to see my, uh, my sister, Carla playing uh, clarinet. That was another very important uh, point for me that uh, that drew, that drew me towards you know music because uh, we used to see her perform. She played clarinet and she used to perform at like Carnegie Hall and stuff. And and uh, at that time, quite honestly, there weren't a lot of uh, uh, black people playing. And I always thought it was so wonderful to see her because she was so beautiful and she was always first chair because she was always very, uh, everything she did was like it turned to gold, you know. Seeing her perform always made me want to perform and the truth of the matter is I wanted to play cello. But um, again, we didn't have any money for a cello or anything like that, you know. And then also seeing my brother perform and play because he's a drummer, that was very impacting to me. And, uh, and I have to say, two, there are two other very important points for me. When Eric McPherson here, uh, I can remember, you know, we used to mess around with music and, and uh, I can remember there was a point where he had me, you know, he would call me and he'd say, hey man, you gotta come over and hear this. You know, and I, would come, and I went to his house and it was a, a record with Jackie McLean and Michael Carvin and I just, man, that, that really took me. I was like, wait a minute. This is something really special, and something that, uh, again, it was like I was bit by the bug. And I have to admit, a couple of other times, it was really through Eric's, Eric, because Eric always had, uh, he would invite me to the house, and he would say, man, you gotta hear this, and you gotta hear that. And, and that's what really drew me in, along with seeing uh, my, one of, one of my first concerts was uh, seeing Richard Davis and Freddie Waits uh, perform, and that was like levitating. I mean, it was like, I can almost feel the ground levitate, you know, and that really took me. And I knew that that's what I wanted to do. My name is Eric McPherson. I'm coming from New York, and I play the drums. And um, I think uh, music is one of those things where, I don't know if you have so much to do with it. It's like, it picks you, you know, like, it picks you, you know, the different things it, they pick you, you know, you have a certain temperament and then that. So an early story that I can remember, um, I think one of the reasons I'm into music is uh, my mother, whose name was Sandra McPherson, she was a dancer. She was a dancer, you know, and she would always have me with her. And she always had a wide orbit of, of creative people. She was around musicians, um, all the musicians that, that would become instrumental in my life. She introduced me to, um, so um, some of my earlier earliest musical memories are, uh, you know, she was a dancer, so she was she was doing a show with a vocalist by the name of John Hendricks. So we we were it was, the show was called Evolution of the Blues. So we were on the West Coast at that time. I know she was doing that. I was quite young. It was like early 70s. Uh, and I know she was, she was doing that show. And I know she also worked at a, at a music venue called Keystone Corner, which is a, was a popular uh, jazz club in the 70s. So she worked there. And so, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm always around in these environments of music and stuff like that. And, and if I'm not mistaken, I was told I met Elvin Jones at a very young age in this club. You know, so I was, and she also introduced me to Charles Moffat. So all of this is like before I'm five, you know, before, so just being around these kind of people. Yeah. Um, then we come back to New York. She introduces me to Freddie Waits and Michael Carvin, who would go on to be uh, instrumental figures just in my 
at development of music. Um, she would also go on to introduce me to Max Roach, <laughs> which blows my mind. She introduced me to Max Roach, Renee McLean, Bill Saxton, uh, Richard Davis. Um, actually, an, an early, an early um, story I remember is the first time that I met Richard Davis. Uh, my mom was like, yeah, let's go. We're going to go to this club. It was a club called Sweet Basil. It's not around anymore, but... And he was playing there, along with Freddie Waits. And she's like, we're going to go to this club. And I was like, I don't want to go to a jazz club. You know, I was like 11 or something. I don't want to go. And they're actually doing a radio broadcast. I actually have the... I actually have documentation of this moment. Um, they're doing a radio broadcast, uh, and I'm watching the band from the bar in Sweet Basil. And as far as the moment when you get bit by the bug, that would probably be it for me, you know, uh, at that moment. Just watching those, those, those musicians play, and the energy and the spirit that was coming from them was, I mean, it's what keeps me going today doing this, you know, because it's like, you see what that, what it's supposed to be, and yeah, just, you're always in that direction, moving to, to that, you know? And as the years go, that becomes more and more important because a lot of these people are no longer with us. So it's like, you know, representing that, remembering that, never forgetting, you know, because that's where everything comes from as far as my... And then on top of that, those people, then I have to add this gentleman right here, Abraham Burton, and that she right wins. Now we're gonna so a huge down reasons down for why I play music. Davis Whitfield at the piano.
Growing up, my dad would be playing, okay. you know, Marvin Gaye, and then the next record would be Sunny Stitt, and then the next, you know, next record would be that, something else. You know what I'm saying? So to me, it was just music. Yeah. And, and if, then, you, if you talk to anybody older, older I know what you, you're going to talk about the radio, radio stations. Exactly. The radio was like that. That's how the radio used to be. There was. But just, you turn the radio on now, and it's like, all right, this station, every song plays sounds like this, this kind of music. Every song sounds like they this. separate. They can yeah. They put everything in a now, separate today, category. That's a problem. Yeah, that's the problem. Then you can't hear for yourself. Yeah. You be like, oh, I like that right. too. Right. They're judging for you. This yeah. is for kids. This is for the youngsters. This is jazz. I have. I'm telling you, it's the funniest thing. I, I love it. You know, in my car, a lot of times when jazz musicians come into my car. They're like, man, what the hell is that? <laughs> what you listening to? You know, because you come into my car, you might hear ACDC or, you, or, or, or like uh, uh, Ozzy Osbourne or, or you might hear some, uh, like some opera or you might hear some Brahms or you might hear some Puccini, straight ahead jazz yeah. or, or, or rhythm, rhythm and blues because I, I, love, I love funk and uh, soul music. I love all music, you know? It's all music. I want to talk about you, Billy Eckstein.
Thank you. Well, that's, a, that's the first time we played this one. That's a new one called, uh, an original of mine entitled, uh, The New Beginning. A New Beginning. So we're going to, yeah, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, it's very tasty. <laughs> We're gonna. How much? How, how much time do we have? Uh, two hours. <laughs> Ten minutes. Okay. We're good. About about that. Okay. That's all right. We, you guys having a good time? Yeah. All right. Because I hope you are. Because we definitely are. I always have a good time playing music, and and definitely with these great musicians. Aren't these some fabulous <laughs> musicians? <laughs> oh, half hour? Really? Oh, okay. All right, we have a half hour. All right. No, no, no. It's cold, cold cut off in Okay, it's cool. It's cool. We'll work it out. <laughs> We're going to... Oh, that's a beautiful blue. I love that. That's nice. What, that's... Uh, what kind of blue is that? That's uh, royal? Is that royal? No, that's not royal. That's like... What? Is that sky? That's pretty. I like... I like... Oh, you, I like blue, you know? I like blue. <laughs> Anyway, we're going to continue with another composition, uh, original entitled Destiny.
Davis Whitfield. Davis Whitfield on the piano. The great John A. Bear. John A. Bear on the bass. The fabulous Mr. Eric McPherson. Eric McPherson on the drums. All right, don't be strangers. We have shows tomorrow night at Southampton Arts on a Bakita Kumalo band. He, he was the bass player with the Paul Simon Graceland album at Southampton Art Center tomorrow. Paul Bolenbach in Montauk at Gossman Stock. Check out our calendar at hamptonsjazzfest.org. We have so much music. There's no excuse anymore to go back to New York City. Stay right where you are. Thank you very, very much. Give it up for Mr. Abraham Burton and Eric McPherson. We were what, maybe about 12, 13, 12, 13. My beginning of the music was like, with, these, with, with Abraham and Ashit, it's like that. It was, it was It like, almost corresponded, like, it, it, it was it necessary. Was it, <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean? It was, I, I wasn't like by myself, it was like, oh, that guy's playing. Right. It was like, it was. Like, Are you saying it was cosmic? Yeah. <laughs> it was, well, you know, for me, I, I wanted to play cello, you know, I, but you know, there was, at that time, I mean, you just didn't see any, uh, Honestly, there weren't very many black uh, people playing cello, and we didn't have any money to buy a cello anyway. <laughs> you know what I mean? It, it is what it was, you know. And uh, and I remember, um, I remember being in school, and my teacher asked me what instrument you want to play, and I said, uh, I actually said the sax. I said the saxophone. You know, I like the way it. I just like the way it looked. You know, I thought it was cool. You know, and I and he asked me, did I want the tenor or the alto? But I didn't know the difference, and I told him the alto. And the alto, I was like, oh, this is really small. And it was the craziest thing that happened was uh, when I picked it up, the very first time I ever put it together, he showed me how to put it together, and I put it in my mouth. Do you remember the the, uh, the TV series, The Odd Couple? <laughs> For some reason, I was able to play it. And everyone in the band like turned around and watched me, and they said, oh, you play this, and you've played and I said, I've never seen, I've never held this instrument in my life. <laughs> it just, it really made a lot of sense to me. And it was a true story. And the teacher came out, uh, Mr. Echoes, Mr. Echoes, he came out and he said, he, and he looked at me, he said, you play, you've played before, if you had lessons? And I said, I've, this is the first time I've ever even seen a saxophone this close, you know? And he couldn't believe it either. I couldn't believe, I don't know, like, it just made sense, you know, to me that way. But that's how I got on, this, on the saxophone. Well, I, I heard that when I was a kid, you know, I was banging on pots and pans and whatnot. So I think that's what prompted my mom to bring me to Charles Moffat. Oh, you know, okay. Because I had that inclination, so she brought me there. And then it's just I was in the environments and around the people, you know, that were instrumental in like creating that stream towards that becoming a lifelong, like lifelong uh, endeavor, you know, lifelong endeavor. To me, it was just all music. I didn't have, I didn't really, I didn't really understand like the categories like that until I got to high school and people were like, oh, you play this, oh, you play that, I play this, and then I started, you know. But that's never been my connection to music. Still, it isn't. But I understand the categories and, and everything. But it was, it was always just music, like playing, you know. So, and it, and it was also uh, the people that we were exposed to. You know, so that was Richard Davis, Freddie Waits, and, and, and on Michael Carvin, and all these, Bill Saxton, were naming like these were the musicians that we had access to, yeah. and that, and then, then buying their records, you know, so that's where Antiquity, that's a Jack and the Queen, Michael Carvin record, and, and uh, other records that you probably, if you didn't know those people, you probably wouldn't know about those records, you know? Okay, I agree so, with that. So, yeah. so, I, so I'm like, I, 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 I feel so grateful, you know, that, that those were the people that I learned from. Most people come to New York. Most people, they're not from New York. We were, we're from New York. We grew up in New York. We grew up in Greenwich Village. And immediately just exposed to all this amazing music that was going around. I mean, at any given time, we're, we're seeing McCoy Tyner, or Art Blakey, or Tony Williams, or Max, Billy Higgins, 
You know, we we yeah. just hit Sonny Rollins. Yeah. You know, we whenever he would play down uh, uh, over by the bottom uh, what is it? Bottom line. Bottom line. Bottom line. And then that's, that's the other thing. There were so many clubs. Yeah, clubs. Yeah, down. We just, I mean, it was crazy how many clubs. We would live outside of them. This way. Yeah, we were just we were too young to get in. So we would just hang out but by the Blue Note, hoist ourselves yeah. up. We watched a whole set of Alvin Jones. That's taking turns. Outside the window. <laughs> Hoisting ourselves up on the window. To the, the wind. point where my, my stomach <laughs> we were sore. was sore. Like it was like a, we were it was sore. Like a, it was like a, a workout. Min, it was a workout. <laughs> we watched the whole set the whole listening set. through the glass. That's you know? right. And we used to do that at Basel. Just yeah, we stay to outside and watch. Yeah, we were just doing that Started, regularly. Just, yeah, we, just, the funny thing was, <laughs> the thing that I remember is we when we were in because we went to all schools together every school right every school so when we were in junior high and i got the saxophone and he was playing the drums we would just go and play duets just regular just we're just playing and don't ask me what exactly because it was just we're just playing music you know you had to. right we would make up tunes <laughs> yeah, and we tune. would have little melodies that we would you know this is that tune this is that tune and then one day he called me and said, man, you've got to come over and hear this, man. He said, I got this record with these two guys that are doing what we're doing. I was like, get out of here. He says, yeah, but you got to come through. And I was like, okay. The record ended up being a Love Supreme, the live version. And when I heard it, I was like, oh, I mean, I was like, oh, we got, this is it. You know, this is it. It's over. This is what we're doing. You know, And, and you know, because it, it was a drum and sax duet, you know, at, on, on pursuance, you know.